All right, welcome everyone. This is our 26th uh, Northeast Digestion Roundtable that Nebra hosts to kind of share knowledge and experience on operating anaerobic digesters. Um, you should be muted as you join the meeting here, but if you aren't, please put yourself on mute. Uh, we will let you unmute and put on your cameras and have a discussion at the end. There's also um, a chat function if you want to put a comment in there. That'd be great as we're going along. And then uh, Jeff will have some questions for all of you at the end as well. So I'm not going to spend too much time introducing Jeff. He's returning. Um, he had presented originally on this project, oh, God, 18 months ago now. And uh, excited to hear about the progress that's been made by the team there at UConn. So I'm going to go ahead and ask Jeff to, I know you're already sharing your screen, but you could turn on your camera there and. My camera's on. Can you see me? Now we can see you. Yes. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Janine. And uh, thank you everyone for being here. Janine, uh, you run these round tables. I think they're really incredible opportunities for the community from diverse backgrounds to talk about uh, biosolids and residuals management. And it's exciting to be part of this. I encourage you to everyone on the, on the call to use the chat feature to ask questions. I'll be monitoring it throughout my presentation, uh, but we'll have some time at the end also to, to have a discussion. Um, today, I'll be talking about our project funded through the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Uh, and this, uh, within that office, the Industrial uh, um, Efficiency and Decarbonization Office is now managing this project uh, under Mark Philbrick. Uh, and we actually were part of WEFTEC last week, or part of our, our part of this program's PI is actually presented on their work. Uh, largely focused on anaerobic digestion. And today I'll be talking about our project, which is to develop a, a digitized and automated platform for optimizing anaerobic digestion performance across a variety of, of metrics uh, based on techno-economic and life cycle assessments. Uh, all my co-authors here are co-PIs or senior performers on this project, and it is a great uh, collaboration between the University of Connecticut, NEBRA, and the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District. Before I get into the project, I have to give my shameless self-promotion of the center that I run here at UConn. Uh, I run the Connecticut Center for Applied Cell Separations Technology, which focuses heavily on uh, membrane separations for a variety of needs in the water, wastewater, industrial separations areas. Um, and we try to find ways to implement advanced separations technology uh, across uh, very ma various manufacturing sectors to lower energy use, reduce carbon footprint, limit waste, and prevent adverse environmental and health impacts. We're located at the Innovation Partnerships Building at the University of Connecticut, a beautiful facility which serves as the front porch of the university for industry interaction. Uh, and I would be happy to welcome anybody on this call uh, to visit us uh, in Stores, Connecticut, if you want to learn more about the things that we do. In our center, and specifically, we focus a lot on different separations technologies related to water, wastewater treatment, uh, fuels processing, gas, uh, gas separations, organic solvents um, uh, at the lab scale and uh, pilot scale size. And so this is something that we can do and work with a number of municipalities or other companies um, to, um, uh, to, to sort of solve some of their problems or challenges. Uh, and we also have the ability to make some membranes with different geometries if this is something that is of interest to you or your company. Um, and one of the key aspects I think that's really relevant to this project in particular uh, that I'll be talking about is access to UConn infrastructure. It's the UConn campus is a living laboratory which has a fully functioning uh, wastewater uh, pollution control facility. It's a wastewater treatment plant that's owned and operated by UConn, a state-of-the-art wastewater reuse facility which takes secondary effluent and treats it for non-potable uses on campus at our power plants and cooling towers. Uh, the, the Yukon Utility Plant, which actually does take this water, and of course, uh, our seawater intake facility. For those of you who are interested in dabbling on the seawater desalination side, we have the access uh, at our Groton, our Groton campus at Avery Point. So if you're interested in working with us, I, I encourage you to either connect with me on LinkedIn, you'll find me easily there, uh, or visit our website at ccast.yukon.edu uh, to, to work with us. 
So let's get into the project a little bit about what we were doing, what we're doing, and, and how we brought this interdisciplinary team across chemical and environmental engineering disciplines to try to improve the performance of anaerobic digesters. So our team consists of myself as the lead and Bai Kun Lee in environmental engineering as our anaerobic digestion expert, George Bolas as a as a as a systems engineer um, with uh, and who works with closely with Matt Stuber, who works on optimization of system processing. Ranjan Srivastava is a machine learning algorithm development expert uh, who is helping us to develop a, sort of a aided control strategy for these anaerobic digesters. And as I mentioned, uh, Janine Burke Wells uh, from Nebra uh, and Sherry Cousins from the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District are some of our partners. And the challenge that we identified back when we first proposed this idea was that uh, digesters are fickle. They don't like to work uh, as you expect them to, uh, particularly if they're small. And so these small to mid-sized anaerobic digesters, what, we, what I would refer to as uh, distributed digestion, uh, suffer from the operability problems leading to poor stability and resilience. And so if we treat them as garbage cans and overload feedstocks, or they undergo fluctuation in feedstock quality or composition, um, there can be uh, catastrophic consequences for digester operation, uh, colony meltdown, and fel other failures can be very hard to recover from and take a digester offline for months at a time. And so there are opportunities here to improve performance and resiliency of digesters, particularly if they're small, and particularly if they have variable feedstocks, as is common with co-digestion, which is of course uh, the digestion of multiple feedstocks, such as food waste, ag waste, and municipal biosolids into the same digester. And so our hypothesis, research question hypothesis and objective are, are shown here on the slide is that we can, can we better control uh, small to mid-scale anaerobic digesters in order to prevent failure uh, and harness better economic and life cycle benefits. Um, so obviously preventing failure is the first step, but can we increase gas production? Can we capture VFAs for valuable chemical production? Can we reduce the overall greenhouse gas emissions of the digester and the wastewater treatment plant that it is likely attached to? And we believe we can through using machine learning algorithms to automate the, the control of these digesters to basically dial in performance to maximize some benefit across either an LCA or TEA metric. Um, and we do, will do this by instrumenting uh, digesters with what we call milli electrode array sensor platforms that provide uh, multi-parameter analysis with high degrees of what we call spatio-temporal fidelity. So we're able to do sort of a high fidelity network uh, that is continuously monitoring digester performance. Um, and the metrics that we're currently looking at uh, for sort of optimization by using this strategy are you know, gas production, life cycle greenhouse gas reduction, solids volume reduction, and revenue generation. So here's a, an illustration of our approach where we're essentially using an anaerobic digester, which is a standard process, but we're implementing what we call the MEA platform, which can measure things like temperature, pH, ammonium, TDS, and a whole host of other metals or ions, depending on what we're actually gonna be looking for. Um, and we wanna be able to derive value from the various streams coming from these digesters. Uh, so let's we'll say uh, energy and energy through the gas, you know, you have value in ammonia and VFAs from the liquids, and of course, biosolids and digestate, which can be used as soil amendments or feedstocks to pyro pyrolysis or some other, other use um, in the solids. And by using the MEA and a control system that allows us to sort of just some parameter of the digester operation, we can optimize the value chain of some of these products. Um, and the machine learning algorithm can be used based on historical data as well as data inside the digester to adjust some of these parameters. At least that's our, our, our idea and our concept around automating uh, the perform the, 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 op the op automating the operation of these digesters. Our municipal partner who has graciously uh, joined us uh, and is providing uh, critical expertise and knowledge of the operation of these digesters is the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District. And they are a wastewater treatment plant operator, but has these have these co-digesters on site, um, which is a very successful implementation of digester of digesters in a municipal setting, where uh, they're generating so much power from these digesters that they actually offset all their power consumption for the wastewater plant as a whole, which is 
a great example of what I would refer to as net zero uh, wastewater treatment. Um, and that's a very cool uh, demonstration. And uh, they're very forward thinking in their use of digestion and co-digestion to achieve these goals. And we're very happy to be working with them. So the first thing I wanna talk about is the data on their digester. They've graciously shared with us a lot of their data and we've developed, and we need to know how these digesters perform and sort of the conventional approaches to monitoring their performance. And so what we've done is we've collected data over up to 10 years of time on the, on the digesters and put it into a dashboard, which allows us to sort of analyze the uh, correlations between various data sets and what is being monitored. I won't go through all the dashboard today, but needless to say, there's some really nice functionality by sort of collating data all together. And I'll say this, in the water treatment and wastewater treatment areas, access to data is actually very difficult and access to the appropriate metadata, which is basically all the data which explains the data that you're actually looking at is also very difficult. Um, and so what this is, what this represents to me is sort of like a base case of capturing data from an anaerobic digester and trying to correlate it to some performance metric. And the nice thing about this particular data is that GLSD has never undergone any kind of um, a meltdown or any kind of failure of their operations. And so it's actually a great example of, of what a, a high performing digester looks like. And it gives us a sense for the kinds of things we wanna be able to achieve um, uh, in, our, in our control strategy. And so I show some examples of what this dashboard has proven to us. This is all data from GLSD, um, where we're looking at total solids, for instance, um, in a food waste tank, which is near, uh, near the actual digester. Uh, and we can look through various uh, parts of the unit operations across the treatment train. We can look at various variables in, uh, across different dates. It's actually a really nice platform to, to explore. Um, you know, for instance, the feed data, what's coming into the digester. We can uh, uh, plot upstream uh, content uh, from the digester uh, and look at things over time. We can look at subsets or full data sets. We can look at the different unit operations themselves, different variables, uh, different annotations uh, that we can show. For instance, we can toggle annotations of when things, when major events happen, like a digester came online, or we start, or, or, or GLSD started to use source separated organics, or COVID occurred, and these can be implemented into the data sets so we can see how these major events may have perturbed the system and maybe would have changed performance over time. And we can also look at the digester itself. So here's an example of looking at pH inside the digester as being monitored by GLSD. And we can really visualize this data effectively. Uh, and even more interestingly, we can visualize where data might be missing. Um, and this isn't a bad thing, having missing data. Sometimes, you know, the sensors go offline or they're not recorded, and that's perfectly fine. You can see in this particular case, the pH is incredibly stable over the course of uh, basically a decade worth of time. Um, but these data gaps can actually be filled in using predictive machine learning algorithm techniques, where you can look at historical data, look at a whole host of other data sets, and then you can actually plug in those missing holes through an automated capability with machine learning algorithms. I can't speak to the details of how that works today. My colleague Ranjan Sarvastava can. I'd be happy to get anyone in touch with you about how we can use existing data to fill in these gaps. But we can also look at across the entire treatment train inside the digester system, how many variables are missing. And this actually gives us the ability to say, for instance, oh, well here uh, around 2008, if you see my cursor, 18, excuse me, we have the fewest number of variables missing uh, for across all data sets, which means this is the data which we have the most information that's characterizing the entire system. And it allows us to say, this data can be used to possibly validate some model that we might develop for the digester. Other, other areas where you have large numbers of missing variables, we can see if we can now fit in some of these predictive capabilities of machine learning to fill in some of these gaps and reduce some of these numbers down a little bit so with some degree of confidence but this analysis is all possible once we put all the data that we have into this dashboard function we can also compare variables so here we have total suspended solids and we have ph and we can look and see if there might be any interesting correlations there's a correlation feature in this dashboard uh, so that we can assess whether or not, say, for instance, you know, uh, gas production versus total dissolved solids, total suspended solids have any kind of correlative effects. And so this dashboard was just set up in the last few weeks, so it's hot off the press, and we're still going to use it 
to try to tease out some of these relationships that I think many operators already know because of their own experience. But for someone like me who has little experience in anaerobic digestion, this is a really important tool that I think might also help other operators or new operators coming online as sort of a training capability. And so this data matters because we can fill in the gaps that do exist with machine learning algorithms based on historical data and relationships between historical data. Uh, and then we can use this data to validate something that we call a digital twin. Now, a digital twin is simply a process model which perfectly or close to as possible perfectly mim mimics the, the system in question, in this case, GLSD's digesters. So this digital twin we want to create so that we can overlay machine learning predictive control strategy on that device so that if we were to say, let's change the feed flow or let's change the mixing rate or let's change this other parameter, and then we observe in the simulated environment how GLSD's digester would change its performance. And the closer this digital twin matches, um, the closer this digital twin matches the performance of the actual digester, the more reliable our, what I would call uh, in silico testing of our control strategy would be important. A great question online about, about uh, nitrogen, uh, nitrate, and ORP. Yes, these are all things that we include, to, we, we intend to be monitoring. I don't think TKN is specifically one of our things on our sensor platform, uh, but nitrate is and ORP is as well. Thank you for that question. So let's talk briefly about the digital twin development and digesters are complicated beasts. Um, you have a, a variety of processes where you take the biomass, you have to get it into a form that can undergo hydrolysis and acinogenesis and acetogenesis, methanogenesis. Each of these processes has many, many equations which describe all of these conversions um, from carbohydrates into sugars to VFAs uh, and ultimately down into biogas. And so uh, models exist, the ADM one or the anaerobic digestion model number one is used to sort of model how a digester might perform given a certain feed stream and other operating parameters. And so we want to we wanted to create the ADM one model um, for the start of our digital twin process, our digital twinning of the GLSD digester. And it's a little bit complicated. This is actually run by uh, our my colleagues George Bolas and uh, Matthew Stuber here at UConn where they have to put in these differential and algebraic equations to describe the dynamic variables, which include everything from soluble matter to inorganic carbon uh, and gases, and also uh, dynamics, uh, uh, additional uh, state variables, which uh, focus more on, say, the cations and anions in the liquid phase um, and other features that um, might be a little bit more uh, simple to model. But otherwise, but generally speaking, lots of different variables, lots of different moving pieces in this model. Uh, and these inputs uh, have to sort of go into this black box of a model and then provide outputs that are of, of importance to us, such as VFAs, biogas, methane content, uh, CO2 content, and so on. And so we've actually built the ADM1 model um, on the IDEAS platform, which is a platform used by the Department of Energy for some of its process modeling. And we tested it with basically a, a, a standard test data set. Um, the BSM2 represents a benchmark simulation model for anaerobic digestion, and it can verify that your ADM1 model does actually work. And you can see here, that we have almost perfect agreement between the BSM2 model uh, and two of our models. One has been developed on the Pyomo platform and one in Julia. Julia is a little interesting, kind of interesting platform because it allows for more non-steady state modeling, uh, which I think is gonna be really important in future modeling of anaerobic digesters that undergo perturbations in their operations. But again, this is work that was done by Matt Stuber and George Bolas, and I would be happy to direct, direct questions directly to them if you have additional uh, interest in understanding how this digital twinning is proceeding. What we hope to do is to actually improve upon the ADM one by one, making it more than just a zeroth order model so we can understand transient behavior, um, but also to incorporate um, more, I would say, spatial fidelity inside the model itself. Digesters are not homogeneous mixtures, even though we might treat them as a continuous stirred tank reactor, they hardly behave that way. 
um, and you have actually different zones in the digester. Some will have higher solids content, some will have lower solids content. And our hope is to create sort of a multiple CSTR model um, and then use uh, modeling toolkits in Julia to understand how those different zones, and such as a high zone, middle, low zone, and the mixing zone can actually um, uh, sort of predict and impact digester performance. And since digesters are all designed differently, sometimes these, these zones occur in different locations. Like in the GLSD digester, the mixing zone's not at the bottom, it's on the sides. And so we have to think more from a spatial fidelity standpoint of how we're going to model these and improve the AVM1 model for its accuracy. One of the ways we can verify the mixing quality and some of these zones is by doing depth profiling in the digester itself. And this is where our sensor platform is gonna be so instrumental. So we have a variety of sensors that we're gonna be implementing into the DL GLSD digester, pH, ammonium, ORP, conductivity, and temperature. These are our first ones that we're gonna be working with, although we do have nitrate sensors and other sensors we can try. Our, our project only calls for these. And we have to think a lot about placement of the sensors, where they're going to go, how we're going to get the data out of the digester, how we're going to mount the sensors in, how we're going to acquire the data and then transmit it to a central location and how often that happens. Um, we also have to think about if we do instrument the digester, how we're going to uh, deal with site safety requirements, PPE, disposal and decommissioning of the sensor system afterwards. We've been thinking a lot about some of these, some of these issues. And the first thing we did was we tested the sensors in actual GLSD digestate. So here's a picture of one of our graduate students during the dirty work underneath the GLSD digester, collecting some of the digestate and then testing some of our sensors back at the lab at UConn. And the result is that we were happy with the performance of our sensors. What you have here is... Uh, some examples of data collected by these MEA platforms, these really cheap, small little sensors that can be inserted just into the digestate, ammonium, pH, ORP, temperature. And what you'll see is the sensor data is in the lines. And then we took some lab samples uh, with uh, benchtop sensors uh, for all of these. And those are the circles. So the circles are the lab sensors, the lines are, the sen are, the, are our sensors. There's a little bit of variability in, AOR, in, in ORP and a little bit of variability in temperature, but it sort of fits within what I would say 10% uh, error of the lab scale sensor. Um, Digestate's a kind of a messy thing to work with. And so I think I'm happy with the way that these very low cost sensors performed, each of these sensors being less than $2 in total cost, which is uh, basically a steal in the sensor environment. And so we uh, decided to prototype this. So we were going to, uh, um, use a PVC Schedule 80 pipe. We were going to attach these sensors to the pipe and connect them with wires in the interior. We just did some initial testing by uh, soldering and, and epoxying these sensors in place um, and adding the connections and sealing those connections up uh, to create what we call the milli electrode array. Uh, so this is six sensors on a pipe for just a, just a test case. We were seeing how this might work. Um, we looked at the digester diagrams, basically the blueprints of the digester. And this is what one of GLSD's digesters looks like from the top. Um, you see that there's no cent there, there is a central mixer, but there, and these are where you're getting a lot of the circulation from these side circulation pumps, which creates a, a circulation pattern as shown by these arrows. Um, and uh, this creates sort of a, a circulation around in this direction, a counterclockwise direction. There's three lo there's four locations that we found that we could we could actually insert one of these pipes into the digester, uh, where basically along the edge it's a floating it's a floating roof and so there's a there's a gap of a few inches along the edge that we can insert uh, these pipes down into the digester through the crust and into the liquid phase. There's also a sample there's also sample ports on top of the digester roof which we can access that that these PVC pipes could be inserted into. Um, and so we decided to go out to GLSD and practice this, which is a really smart thing to do. Uh, this was a this was a digester that was offline, and so there was nothing in the digester. Uh, it was being cleaned out and recommissioned for for I think uh, sometime this year or later next year. Um, and so uh, uh, Sherry and Brett led us on top of the digester to practice inserting what would be just these are just mock up. Uh, 
pipes and sensor platforms and on, on top and in the center. And you can see us trying to insert these really long poles and looking to see like how we might access certain depths inside the digester. This was mostly just a play day. Um, but we learned a lot about the process and we learned that actually it, this is going to, this would be very difficult. And we had to rethink how we were going to install some of these, some of these sensor probes. And so we decided to uh, sort of limit ourselves to two sensor locations. Uh, again, here's the mixers. Here's uh, also central mixing where you have uh, digestate being brought up to the center and then being placed, pushed out to the top. Um, we can, we have about uh, 19 feet of headspace, which is the gas space, and about 33 feet of depth. Uh, and when the, the, the when this when this lid is down, uh, it sort of it seals a wet seal on the edge here. So there's an edge here uh, near the wall location where the the roof is actually sealed up against the liquid. And we want to be able to insert our sensors into the liquid phase and not the gas phase. And so this sample port has a tube that goes down to the liquid phase, which would work for us. Um, we would place our sensors uh, in arrays down the pipe uh, as we would uh, then run wires back up the pipe and down the digester to, to our data collection system. Um, we had designed a, um, uh, like a holder for the edge as a nice uh, metal wall along the edge top of the digester, which we could uh, secure the wall to, uh, the wall sensors to, and then the sample port would essentially be bolted to a new cap on that sensor port that would be uh, used to hold our pipe in place. But then we ran into a huge problem. None of us, uh, none of us in our team had ever worked with an actual real digester. We'd only worked with like lab scale digesters and small digesters. Um, and we ran into this problem of, of classified environments. Um, and we never really thought much about this because all of our sensors work at such small voltages that we never would have imagined that this would be an issue with, with any explosions or any issues associated with this. But we realized pretty quickly once we started to talk to uh, GLSD as well as some of our environmental consultants that we had hired for this project that we would be unable to necessarily classify our sensors as something that we would call a simple device, which would be able to work within what we call a class one div one environment or a class one div two environment. So everywhere within 10 feet of a digester is what we call a class one div one environment, which means there's a risk of explosion if there is an unexpected electrical discharge and we needed to be aware of that. Um, and these, even though our sensors could likely be classified as what's called a, a simple apparatus, it was unlikely we would be able to get that designation during the course of this project. So um, uh, I see a couple of questions. I'll get to these questions in just a minute. Thank you very much for putting them in here. Um, we also could use commercial sensors that were classified, but they were crazy expensive. They were like a thousand dollars a piece or more. And who knows how long they would actually last inside of a digester environment. Many of them had um, wiring that were connected to the actual sensor. The sensor was classified, but then the connection would not be classified or rated for use in a submerged environment with high levels of TD of, of total suspended solids. Like there were all these other certifications that the sensors that we could buy uh, ultimately wouldn't meet. And so this was a big problem. Um, and we ran into this problem uh, right at the, at the at a critical juncture of our project. And then we had a great conversation with Brown and Caldwell um, to provide us uh, an alternative. And so what we decided to do, and I apologize that this is hard to see on your screen. This is a, this is kind of a, a diagram that we created um, to instead of putting the sensors in the digester to instead siphon digestate out of the digester to the sensors outside of the classified environment. Uh, and in this case, you see multiple depths of, of siphons. Uh, we do have temperature sensors that we could place um, that are classified. Uh, uh, for 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 use in a class one div one environment, um, this is just an option. Though I don't think we're going to do this next. I think we're just going to put our siphon in and bring out to it, bring all these digestic these digestic flows to a sensor array platform that we will use outside of the outside of the classified environment. And so we have a couple of locations for 
for samples. We're going to limit our, our sampling to the area near the safety railings where, where students and staff can easily access them in case there needs to be maintenance or replacement. And we're not going to use any area outside of the safety railing because these lids will lift about 10 feet or more higher than they are when we were actually there. Um, and then we have devised a, a flow system cartridge for our sensors, a nice 3D printed cartridge where our sensors can go into the digestate flow, which will be fed to uh, an external, external place. And then we would like to take this information, understand some of this, uh, some of these zones of performance as best we can, and implement that into a modeling, our modeling platform to improve the ADM1 model. Um, and this will allow us to basically create and simulate anaerobic digester controls within our digital twin. And so this is a, a plan that uh, Matt Stuber and some of our, our automation and modeling team will be working on once we have more data. And so um, this is uh, the things we'll be working on next. Brown and Caldwell, uh, uh, we just got under contract with Brown and Caldwell to help us uh, to with our sensor installation plan to make sure that we're being safe. Uh, and we want to continue to, do, to develop and instead ultimately install our sensors at GLST and validate the ADM1 model with GLST data. Oh, I left a, I have a hanging, uh, excuse me about this. We want to be able to basically then develop the digital twin and the, and the process modeling and control approach uh, in that digital twin. And we hope to maybe even look at technology transfer options for the sensor platform. This is a very low cost, high fidelity sensor platform that could be used in other wastewater and anaerobic digestion environments um, with the ultimate goal of trying to identify where you might have opportunities for process performance improvements to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or energy consumption, or even to try to derive additional value. Um, because this, ultimately we are getting toward uh, turning our wastewater plants into resource recovery facilities. And so uh, I think having good sensors uh, implemented in these plants uh, is a very valuable thing to do to accomplish that goal. So I have a lot of questions for the round table. I wrapped up a little early because I want to make sure that we have some time to discuss. I know we have some questions in the chat that I'll get to in just a minute. Um, but um, I won't read through these right now. These are mostly just kickoff questions in case there's there's not discussion. It sounds like that won't be a problem today. Um, <laughs> but I think what I'd like to, to really ask this community is, is data good or bad? So I'm part of the National Alliance for Water Innovation, and this is a Department of Energy sponsored hub dedicated to improving water and wastewater treatment in the United States, as well as desalination technologies. And I have long been a proponent of incorporation of greater sensors, uh, for greater numbers of sensors in water treatment systems. And I get some pushback from my colleagues in the organization saying that not more data is not necessarily a good thing. And so I'd like to hear from the community about the importance of data. How much do you want? Is, too, is there too much of it? Uh, and is that, is that a bad thing? And how that data can be used to improve process performance or even automate systems uh, as we maybe try to move away from heuristics and experience from operators and move toward more an automated approach, if that's something that municipalities even want. So this is a great opportunity for me to hear from the community about what it is you're actually looking for. Um, and if we might be able to sort of adjust some of our goals to meet some of those needs. Uh, so thank you, Janine, uh, for putting this on and I'm hoping we can have a robust discussion. Yeah, no, this is this is great. And uh, I liked how you explained your, your problem that you did encounter, but how you guys got through that was awesome. Um, learned a lot as well. So if, if somebody wants to go ahead and answer the question, you can just unmute yourself now. Uh, and personally, I feel like this industry doesn't do an, doesn't collect and use enough data. Um, the Maybe that's I'll very true. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to say that's very true, Janine. As an industry, we're really behind the, uh, the eight ball when it comes to data collection. Um, it, with respect to digestion specifically, uh, it really depends. I hate to say this. I remember my consulting days now. It really depends where uh, you are. If you have digesters that uh, have relatively uh, uh, decent base loadings and that there's not a lot of perturbation in, 
Uh, the le level of data collection uh, that you actually need is, you know, frankly, minimal. Uh, you know, in my uh, days in operations, I uh, actually had, uh, I reduced data collection from using manual samples, things like volatile acids and things just not really needed. If you have a sense of where your pH is uh, and your uh, alkalinity are, uh, from those two measurements, you can basically uh, extrapolate uh, digester stability, volatile acid levels, uh, you can estimate volatile acid levels. And uh, you know, from an operational standpoint, you really don't need the actual number. What you need is to know, um, are my uh, operating parameters changing or not? Now, on the other extreme, um, when you're operating uh, digesters under heavy loadings or are exposing them to uh, variable loadings or uh, relatively low SRTs, uh, then uh, you can get swings and you do need to have uh, your early, um, early warning system in. Um, and that early warning system is typically going to be, uh, you know, frankly, pH levels and changes in pH levels, assuming everything else is consistent. It, uh, very, I really, your, your sensor arrays and the ability to measure, you know, things like, um, Ammonia, for example, with a relatively, well, not relatively, ridiculously inexpensive sensors is utterly amazing. So uh, really looking forward to hearing more about that. But Yeah, Jeff, I'm curious if on the bad side, the people that are arguing that it could be bad, is it because of cost? Because, yeah, I think that shouldn't be an argument. No, I don't think it's because of cost. I think, I think the... <laughs> I think part of the concern was that it was because it would be almost like too hard to understand large amounts of data and then to make yeah. it you know what to do with it. I think there might also be like some regulatory concerns. Um, like do you have to report all this data? Right. Understand, like, let's say your your plant exceeds nitrogen uh effluent for a day by a factor of 10 over the regulatory environment, but then it's like 10 times less for 30 days after that. Like we understand that that's okay, but the public might not. Right. Oh my gosh, yeah. the, the plant did something terrible. No, it's it's an average. Uh, it's like, right. Right. like, those are the kinds of questions that I think are hard. So sometimes you need a data platform that explains everything really easily. This is why metadata is so important. And you need easy to understand um, explanations for data. That's why I like sort of building a dashboard system that you can ultimately maybe have even more data to be put into. Like here's one digester that works this way and that digester works this way. So well, I should, I have a question back for Dimitri. Um, if you're measuring pH to detect something that's going off, you know, that's going awry, once you detect it, is it already too late? Um, well, remember that uh, what uh, the saving grace in digesters is that you have multiple days of solids retention time, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully more than 15. And ideally, when we're heavily loading digesters in particular, we're targeting something on the order of about 25 days. So ideally, you uh, have, especially if you have an online, uh, the combination really of pH and alkalinity is what you're targeting. But if you don't have alkalinity, pH is, is an indicator. Uh, if you manage to have both pH and alkalinity, and, uh, I'm not sure you need it online either, again, depending on the digester. But online, uh, I'm not sure you even really need the online measurement of the alkalinity. Uh, with careful sampling so you don't uh, uh, mess up the sample and get a wrong alkalinity measurement, uh, the alkalinity won't change much within a day or so. Mm. Uh, same thing with, you know, the volatile acids. We had our folks uh, sampling volatile acids twice a week and looking at the number. Really, it's not something that you would react to. Uh, in all, uh, you know, you're not going to see a change in the volatile acids that's going to be so rapid that we'll, you will do something differently. That's helpful. Thank you. Um it's uh, digestion is a little bit different from, you know, from the story is totally different on the liquid side mm -hmm. where you actually can take actions and you do take, you have to take action with the digesters. Um, the, the loss of the uh, digester is relatively um, slow. 
the trick is to make sure you have a system in place to catch it right. before it gets really bad because it's not going to get bad from one day to the next. Right. I think someone had answered that second bullet question there in the chat, maybe. Yeah, I see some great com conversations about, you know, NO2, NO3, TKN. Um, and then if you have food waste, SO4 and sulfide would be important variables to consider. I agree with all of these, all these points. I think that that is, um, I know GLSD likes to use the food waste because it boosts gas production. And I think that's something that is, is well understood here with the high organic content of these wastes. Um, so, but monitoring some of, I'm, I think some of these are probably monitored in, in, a, in, a, in a grab sample approach. Um, uh, and particularly for for discharge of the liquid digestate. So these are, we do have, so the, the sensor platform itself, I didn't talk too much about it, I apologize, but the sensor platform itself is a, a solid state ion selective membrane sensor, this particularly for the ammonium and for basically any metal you can imagine. We developed a platform for um, in, incorporating uh, high affinity selectophores into these membranes that are membranes that are on top of the sensors that give you exceptional selectivity and detection in the presence of counter other ions as well. And so we're using these in wastewater systems. Uh, they've been tested in, in, in biological nutrient removal processes. And while anaerobic digestion is quite a bit more harsh of an environment, they don't have to last too long if they are as cheap as they are. Uh, at least that's our, that, that's our hope here. Um, let's see a couple other questions from the chat here. Um, what feedstock characteristics are you tracking in your model? I should know the details of this and I apologize <laughs> that I don't. Um, I know that there are a lot of, uh, parameters that are being monitored. I wish one of my colleagues was here to answer that specific question. Um, but it, it, I, I, I'm not going to try to venture a guess without making myself sound foolish. <laughs> If you can get the answer, Jeff, I'll, I'll be happy to follow up with this group. Oh, I will definitely do that. I'm writing, I'm writing um, these questions down, and I will um, forward them answers to you when I have when, when I get a hold of my group. Yeah, that would be great. I do see one or two operators on here, and I'd love to hear the answer to your fourth bullet there. If if they have concerns about failure, if it happens, if it's happened to them. Uh, you know, like you said, GLSD is a very well run. Um, and again, that comes down to the operators, right? Oh. What they know and how they how they operate it. So um, I got to say, most of the, the facilities are that I know of, wastewater facilities that run anaerobic digesters are doing a heck of a job. So they just must have the operator who's, you know, been there for. Yeah, this is a this is a good point. Um, it actually makes, it makes, I, I was, I was hoping that, that GLSD could show me data of a, of a failure so we could like see what happened leading up to it because that can train your machine learning algorithm for the predictive control, Sure, but they haven't failed. So <laughs> I don't see it. So we're actually trying to gather data from other digesters that have had, have had either a foaming event or some other event that, uh, represents failure about any operation to some extent. Um, we have some of that data. It's just, it's hard to parse through all the data and understand what it all means. And everyone has different data taken at different intervals. And then you have to cross your fingers and hope that their data was captured with a calibrated sensor. And there's always, there's so many places where you could have an error. Um, and that you're only as good as your data uh, from, from a machine learning training perspective. Yep. Dean, I've got a, a comment. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, hey. Okay, hi. This is Stephen with Kiwit, and I just think this is absolutely wonderful. Um, a game and, changer, uh, that's what I call it. Yeah. So I've got a couple of thoughts. So, you know, I've, I've not run an anaerobic digester for uh, 15 years, and I actually ran two big digesters, uh, one in the U.S. and one in Europe, right before leaving engineering consulting and going back to get a, 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 an MBA uh, and study business. And one of the things I learned in business school was about the bullwhip effect. And what the bullwhip effect is, is, is an idea that big box stores like Walmart used basically to be competitive. And, and a, a problem in Walmart is when a customer would go in the store and there was no inventory. 
and there would be a stock out and then the customer would get upset and they wouldn't come back. And, and, and what supply chain experts have realized is, is just variation going into a supply chain like Walmart is extremely bad. So what Walmart did was they worked to drive out all of the variation in their supply chain. And supply chain specialists thought they could use like math and, and, and all of the uh, statistics basically to make the supply chain better. But in fact, all of their adjustments made it worse. So they magnified the errors. And when I took that idea and looked back on operating wastewater plants and in particular anaerobic digesters, I think that there is a sound idea that can be applied to digestion. That variation is extremely bad. Temperature variation, food variation. I mean, the previous speaker talked about, uh, you know, uh, increasing loading and sometimes you have to do that, but really that's, that's, that's setting the digester up for a very negative uh, situation. So I think, I think the instruments and, and the tracking of the data is spectacular, but my concern is that people will try to rely on that instead of thinking about simple things like eliminating variation in temperature and feed and mixing or whatever in your digester. And then um, the second thought is I just read an outstanding book, The Microbiology of Anaerobic Digesters by a fellow named Michael Girardi. I think he's up in your area. We and, know, we know him like. Yes. And so as I read his book, I thought, you know what, this is a control strategy. If I could put an, every, an instrument in and everything that he talks about, uh, and in particular on alkalinity, because with, with thermal hydrolysis, which is being used at a lot of uh, plants in the U.S. And, and, and is used a lot overseas, you, you rupture these protein cells. And when you do that, you increase alkalinity. And Michael points out in his book, there's an inverse relationship between alkalinity and surface tension. And when the surface tension goes down, you may cause foaming. And 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 I just thought, wow, that that's really interesting. So I I would I would take a look at that, uh, and 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 look at alkalinity and how that relates to foaming. But uh, but uh, I I think that as I said, the idea to track all of this is a very good idea. I'm just my concern is the operators would just sit at their computer instead of going out and and, yep. and, and measuring what's going on in the digester. Valid point. Great point, Steve. Thank you so much. I've taken some notes here. Yeah, I think it would be good if we could automate the intervention as well. And so if we had a way to measure what's happening inside the digester cleanly and easily, and then we detect, oh, there's an alkalinity change. Um, we're gonna we're coming up on a oh, we're gonna have a foaming event. So then we change some operating parameter. We put some chemical in to to adjust surface tension. Um, these kind of things might might, might be might be automated um, and detected before someone has to look at the data and see that problem. And I agree with Dimitri in that long residence long retention times are actually helpful in this case it gives you time to respond we want to understand some of those time lag responses so that we can identify well, what's the most critical uh parameters that have the shortest response time requirement prior to failure um and i don't know what those particular parameters are um but we hope to be able to figure some of those out um, in some of our modeling There's some more comments in the chat. Anyone else have? Uh... The chat is the <laughs> chat is alight with with activity here. Uh, it is. Um, oh yeah, and you got some people wanted to help you out. Yeah, this information as well. Um, on the on the bullet about our municipalities conducting GHG emission inventories. I mean, I could speak to that a little bit. I actually went to Weftech early on Sunday, and helped out with a eight hour workshop for utility operators on how to start doing basic accounting. Um, it was sold out, but I but these are forward thinking utilities, bigger utilities that are kind of doing that work right now. The majority of them aren't. And they're really just they're using tools like ECAM, Beam to to go ahead and estimate what their emissions are so they can at least have a baseline. Um, 
you know, I think why are they not doing it? It's for a lot of the medium and small facilities. They just, they got their head down operating that treatment facility and, uh, GHGs, PFAS, all this stuff is, is, can be a distraction sometimes. If you could come up with some, some way to help monitor GHG emissions at treatment facilities, um, real time data, that would be, that would be terrific too. Yeah, I'll, I'll take this as an opportunity to, to talk about um, the Department of Energy's recent call last December on greenhouse gas emissions reduction at wastewater resource recovery facilities. They launched an RFP to explore this issue and a number of wastewater treatment plants. And you couldn't just be a wastewater treatment plant. You had to be a wastewater resource recovery facility, which means either in a digester or reclamation plant or something on site that would recover some of the value. And um, we got one of these at UConn because we have a wastewater reclamation facility on site and we're an owner operator of our wastewater plant. So we are going to be instrumenting our biological and nutrient removal process, our activated sludge uh, system, which actually has both aerobic and anaerobic zones in it. Um, we're gonna be instrumenting that. And then we're going to be detecting N2O emissions, N2O being the big problem, the big greenhouse gas emitter. Absolutely, 70% of the emissions and a stronger one than CO2, yep. So we have a little sniffing sensor that we're going to buy it's going to be very expensive and we're going to do a greenhouse gas emissions inventory of our of our of our bnr uh for just n2o i don't know if we can do methane and um co2 as easily but we'll, we're going to give it a try that we do a mass balance to see where it's all going um but then we're going to instrument our digester for with with nitrate sensors so that we can and other nitrogen sensors to see where there might be problematic zones in the BNR. Because particularly our BNR, which is like one of these serpentine BNRs, it has a name, I forget the exact name on it, but because- Oxidation they, ditch. Is that what it's called? I uh, think you have an oxidation ditch, yeah. Thank you. I, I should learn all the, the lexicon. The But it but it transitions from oxic to anoxic zones. And so right. uh, because the that's so dependent on flow rate and composition, that can move a little bit. And so you want to see if that creates a- uh, an emission problem. So that's what we're going to be using the same sensor platform for, but for different, different sensing, di different detection in a very different environment. Cool. Hey, Jeff, Jay wants to offer a case study on variability. Oh, uh, I'd love to please. hear that. Please, yeah, okay. no, go for it. Can you, can, you hear, can you hear me, folks? Yeah, yep. go ahead, Jay. Okay. Uh, I, my name is Jay Kulowick. I've been around this business too long. <laughs> <laughs> no such thing. Well, I don't know. I got my master's degree from Manhattan College the the year of Earth Day one. Uh huh. <laughs> oh. Okay, but I'm still right. practicing. And uh, what I wanted to bring up is I worked. I I'm on my own right now as an independent, but I've worked for uh, Malcolm Perney and Arcadis. And one of my last projects with Arcadis was a uh, we worked for a food uh, a, a food processing plant in South Central Pennsylvania. Uh, that was called Nell's Foods. In fact, they they were in, it, they were in the fruit business, everything from applesauce to cherries to peaches and everything else like that. Really, really high strength wastewater, and they had to get they had to stop uh, land application because of uh, the state of Pennsylvania didn't think it was going to be effective anymore, and there were some issues. But we found ourselves because the waste strength was so high is 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 going with a, uh, and I think that the vendor. Uh, was you, some of you probably heard of it? ADI, who make uh, who 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 who, who uh, market certain anaerobic technologies, and there's a lot of them used in the food industry. Uh, but we found ourselves, we actually piloted uh, the anaerobic process for a full 14 months in order to pick up all of the variability that you get over the seasons, because the kind of waste stream that's coming out of Apple processing is a lot different than from cherry processing or peach processing. And they learned a lot about uh, the variability that occurs when the feedstock changes. And it even became more important because this was a facility that had to have its own NPDES permit and discharge. And we followed up the uh, anaerobic uh, and with energy recovery, uh, the, uh, the liquid stream or the digestate, so to speak. Uh, with a membrane bioreactor for both carbon and nitrogen removal. Uh, and we found some interesting 
things with that, particularly as the uh, 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 as the feedstock, meaning what fruit they were processing, changed from season to season. Mm -hmm. And it turned I out bet, that yeah. one of the things we had was when we when they did peaches, we had a real color problem <laughs> that uh, conventional biological treatment would not take out. Uh, so I think ultimately they went with, uh, I think they did an effluent polish with either ozone or possibly a carbon contactor, which solved the issue of color, which there were some state standards that they had to meet in that regard. So uh, I just want to emphasize that probably more so with industrial facilities or municipalities that have significant industrial load contributors, whether that's a brewery or a distillery or a food processing plant or a, a, you know, a, a yogurt manufacturer or a cheese manufacturer, all of those things are gonna play into how straight line is a digester gonna be able to run versus uh, what's going on in your, uh, in your customer's plant and what they're discharging. Yeah. Yeah, and that's one thing at GLSD. Well, I don't know what they were doing before, but when they started accepting the food slurry, I mean, that is a very well mixed, uh, homo mm -hmm. pretty much homogeneous feedstock. They know what I, they're I, getting. It's the yeah. same all the time. Yeah, I, I have a question for the group. And I, I'm from Connecticut, and I practice in Connecticut most of my life, but also in other places, is that uh, does anybody think there's going to be a, a, a new municipal anaerobic digester in Connecticut? Because right now, the list is pretty short. It's zero. <laughs> yeah, this is one of my goals in life is to get more anaerobic digestion at treatment facilities. But yeah, you 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 ask a good question. What do you think, Jeff? Well, Connecticut right now incinerates all of its municipal biosolids because it's allowed, and many states. Well, don't. I I think I think PFAS is going to put an end to that. Well, PFAS is actually <laughs> preventing digestion uh, in Connecticut because you can do you can do municipal biosolids digestion in Connecticut, but you can't blend food waste with it by law. That's and, right, because of the bacteriological aspect of it. You agree. That, yeah. That's why, uh, and I've done some work for the one, the one commercial active, commercial facility, Quantum Biopower, yeah. and, they, and they've been arguing, fighting, and, and begging the state of Connecticut for over a decade to be able to expand out and not do f just food waste, but food waste and biosolids. It'd be an incredible opportunity for them to add to their tipping fee a revenue for sure. But, and, and I mean, I talked to, 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 to quantum biopower too. It's, it's, we're one of like three States that doesn't allow it. Um, yeah, that's and, right. And I talked to DEP. I had a bunch of them on a call. Um, and it was, it was interesting to kind of, try to understand the the reason for this and they i think they 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 really say that it's because of pfos and that there's pfos in municipal biosolids but there's not in food waste digestion food food waste digestion which i don't i don't agree with um yeah there may but, be less but there is in there but basically by blending them you contaminate the digestate and prevent land application yeah, that's true. And and that's why, as you pointed out with the regional incinerators and what's going on in New Hampshire and uh, par parts of Massachusetts, that's why uh, uh, we've increased the, the, the uh, greenhouse gas emission footprint for all of the trucks that are hauling sludge into Connecticut now in order to have it burn because it can't be blend applied anymore. I, which is, I, yeah, I agree. Which is good to me as an oxymoron. <laughs> well, I mean, I asked, I, I asked, I asked deep and like and like so you take your salt but your biosolids and what do you do with them? Well, you you die, you incinerate them. I'm like, where's the PFAS go? <laughs> and it's like <laughs> crickets in the room. Um, well, it goes up the smokestack and then it gets land applied when it falls out of the air. <laughs> unless those unless those incinerators are operating above a thousand degree Celsius, I don't think you're going to mineralize the PFAS. Right. Um, and I if, think if, that, if 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 any of not not to get off the subject of digestion completely but on the on the PFAS is that there was a 36 36 POTWs were studied over the last two years in Connecticut for basically life cycle of PFAS that's something you may want to look at it's on the it's on the D, uh, Connecticut DEP website you can find yeah it we got that that's on our news uh, page as well yeah, yeah, um, yeah. too but not to get 
not to get off PFAS, okay. but I do think the life cycle cost analysis that you're doing as part of this project, Jeff, is critical because we need to think about greenhouse gas emissions. And some um, of these newer technologies coming out are very energy intensive. And Jay and everybody else on this call, if you have examples that are publicly available for a digester variability, I would data sets, yeah, data sets, I'd, I'd really like to see those and to share them with our data, our data team. I love this. I, I mean, the seasonal vari variation is significant. We have we have variability data for GLSD during COVID because their food waste uh, right. uh, drops. Oh yes. And so when they when they when during COVID their biogas generation dropped, um, so that was like an example of a perturbation in a wastewater treatment plant. We see similar things at a place like UConn because during breaks the students go away and and our wastewater treatment plant starves and they have to yep. pull the poor sugar in the thing to keep it going, um, and so. Those kinds of examples are actually really valuable data for us to create predictive algorithms. So um, if anyone has a, a shareable data set, I would love to see it. Yeah, and I'll put that ask out there as well when I follow up, Jeff, so. Thank you, Janine. Yeah, we're all root view. This is this is a game changer. It could be really, we. this could help with my goal of getting anaerobic digesters everywhere. I also see there's a comment here about a modeling platform called Sumo. I am not familiar with this, but I'd like to learn more about it and share it with my team that's developing the ADM1 platform in Julia. So um, if there's, uh, this is from Edwin. I don't know if, if he's still on the call. We're a little over time, but um, if, if uh, anyone would like, would like to get, would send me a link or something, I'll take a look if I can find it. But if uh, any information, I would love to share with my team. He is not on the call, but I can follow up with him and I'll make a note right now. Thank you. Sumo. All right. Thanks again for joining us, Jeff. Um, thank thank you. It was it's nice to see you in Chicago spreading the good word. Yeah, it was great. I uh, We got a picture. I put it on LinkedIn, Janine. So yeah. we'll there. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for your feedback and your help. And please reach out to me. Um, I'll put my my, my email. Uh, I think my email uh, is probably in the invitation for this. Uh, please, please reach out to me if you have any questions. Okay. All right. Thanks, day. everyone. Happy Friday. Have a great weekend. Bye -bye. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. Thanks for engaging and contributing. See ya. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Janine.